Hi, it's Grace. Welcome back to my channel. I hope that you're all doing really, really well. Today, I wanted to film a video about my favourite books by Asian and Pacific Islander authors. Obviously, May is, well, in America, May is Asian American and Pacific Islander month. Um, and whilst I'm not in America, um, and these books aren't necessarily by Asian American authors, it is on Booktube the month of the Asian Readathon. I've been reading loads of amazing books by Asian authors this month and so I wanted to film a video talking about some of my favourite books of all time that are from API authors and although I'm coming to this a little bit late in the month uh, for any recommendations obviously it's not just in the month of May that we will or should be reading books by these authors and so it's just always good to have a cheeky little recommendations video ready for whenever all these books are amazing could read them in any month and i would highly recommend that you do also i should say as i say i've read some amazing books this month that i'm not gonna mention in this video this is kind of like just of all time books i've read previously because you'll hear me talking about those books in my may wrap-ups i've already talked about some great ones in wrap-up part one i've also got a reading vlog coming at you on monday which is doing like the asian readathon vlog where i use cindy's prompts and every book I read in that video was amazing. So I can't wait to put that video out and give you even more recommendations but to cut to the chase I'm gonna be talking about 10 books I absolutely love that were written by Asian or Pacific Islander authors. So let's get into it. First up in news that will be surprising to no one I had to pick a Kazuo Ishiguro novel. Ishiguro is one of my favourite authors of all time. I could have really picked any of his books. I've read five of his novels and four of those five have been five stars it was actually really difficult to choose one i was talking on the group chat and i was like hannah was like which one's your favorite and i was like it's this one or that one or that one or that one um but i decided to choose remains of the day for this video i absolutely love this novel i mean i'm not in a minority by any means it won the booker prize but i just think this is such a beautiful book i think that the reason I love Ishiguro so much is that he's such a kind of like dexterous author. He can do so many different things. And this book is a kind of country house, um, English, slightly historical novel. We're following a butler called Stevens who has worked um, at this house. It's called Darlington Hall for a long time. It's 1956 over summer where this novel takes place, but he's worked there for a long time. He takes his job very seriously like he has the girl boss energy that no one wants the toxic productivity is Stevens because he's like obsessed with being a butler his father was a butler before him he sees it almost as like a calling a vocation and he doesn't really like the idea that you fangled styles of butler might be coming in he was the butler for one kind of lord for a very long time but recently he has a new um, boss an American who bought Darlington Hall and he's really kind of struggling at the start of the novel with that change and um, this book talks a lot about banter um and he really struggles with like his american boss trying to like banter him and he'll be thinking like okay i've prepared a bit of banter that i'll do for when i see him in the morning um so stevens is just a very like straight laced person and it gives the narration just like a very restricted formal style is all about like the small details it's really meticulous i know people who don't like this book say that you know in the first 50 pages it was literally just all about the ins and outs of how to butler properly which is true but like i say it also has that sort of like humor at the start of it so immediately i just loved stephen's narration i was really interested to see where the book went and where it does go is that his boss says look bro you need to take a holiday and he's like what is holiday so he rents a car and he drives around the south of england to some like scenic places he's always wanted to go to um and while he's doing that he reflects on his years of service and starts to kind of acknowledge or come to terms with the ways in which he has excuse me that's the doorbell uh what was i saying yeah he kind of starts to acknowledge and come to terms with the fact that maybe his life wasn't as fulfilling as he would have liked or i guess he thinks about the ways in which putting his job before anything has meant that he's missed out on stuff and it's kind of tragic and heartbreaking in its sort of melancholy and as Stephen sort of slightly lets you in a bit more to his past and to his true feelings you just see all the ways in which by being so kind of indebted and feeling such servitude and such responsibility to this 
kind of class system in England and this unwavering support of his lord and master um he has not really lived his life he kind of tries to meet up with on this car journey a woman who used to work at the hall and you learn more about their relationship you learn about the relationship with his father who was also a butler and it is just so bittersweet so like i say heartbreaking tragic but done so quietly so subtly the end of this book just moved me so much but we never get all of stevens you know it's all done in that really restrained way uh we just see kind of glimpses of it and it's a really beautiful but sad story of a life it also has like a bit of an element of intrigue as we learn more about the lord before this american man and what kind of stuff he was potentially involved in that wasn't the best and again stephen's kind of like battling with feeling this responsibility to him feeling this loyalty to him um but the ways in which in the lead up to the second world war some kind of dodgy things were going on at the hall and so i loved it i felt like i love that little tiny element of darkness and that intrigue but then also it was funny it was just heartbreaking i love ishiguro's prose and yeah i think this is an absolutely stunning book and it's one of my favorites next up we have the defendants by kai hart hemmings so hemmings is a hawaiian author and this book it was made into um a film with george clooney and i'd seen the film before i read the book and i loved the film it's one of my favorite films and i actually did a video where i was like reading the books inspired some of my favorite films and so i read this book and it totally surprised me and i loved it so so much so we're following um our main character matt king who is the kind of descendant of one of hawaii's like largest landowners um and oldest families and basically there's like some sort of legal thing where after a certain amount of time they had to decide what to do with the land and he is kind of like the descendant in charge he has all these cousins who are all arguing about what to do with this land but he is i guess like the first son of the first son whatever it's kind of up to him that all kind of happens before the novel and the novel starts because matt's wife um is involved in a boating accident and she's in a coma and so he has been a kind of absent father he works a lot he has two teenage daughters um but now he's suddenly thrust into trying to take care of the family while his wife is ill suddenly having to like be present with his teenage daughters but also struggling with um something he found out about his wife before she was taken ill and that he never had the chance to confront her about but is kind of eating him up inside and it's just such an emotionally intelligent entertaining just like gorgeous gorgeous book and this book again made me laugh so much it has a really kind of like not dark humor but a kind of black humor you know this family are in a terrible situation matt is like so stressed out and so heartbroken and he doesn't know what to do um and there's just so many little funny bits of him interacting with his two teenage daughters who are just like also going through a lot of grief and have a lot of issues with their father that on that are unresolved um, and they kind of are just trying to make it through this really difficult time in their life um, and like I say I found it really funny but I also just found it like really moving I was like crying so much in the end I've just realized the blurb kind of gives a bit more than I gave away so the thing he found out about his wife was that she's having an affair and so he's like determined to kind of find out who she was having an affair with and he's so heartbroken and angry but at the same time his wife's in a coma and unlikely to wake up and his daughters have to deal with saying goodbye to their mother um and it looks a lot at like their relationship when they first got together and how it changed and all the characters are just really really three-dimensional you really lo have so much love um for these i mean i love sister stories but for these sisters and their relationships with their father and as they go on this like i guess journey to try and make peace and closure and say goodbye to their mother it's super moving but also you see so much growth in them as a character it's just a really beautiful family story it's also interesting in um the way it talks about hawaii and like i say the sort of um colonial past of hawaii basically this family that matt comes from generations ago um are like white colonized and married a hawaiian princess and so that's how this all came to be and it's interesting on that and you know the settings of hawaii are really beautifully evoked and i just love this book i think it's a real hidden gem the cover is disgusting don't get me wrong it's it's heinous uh, but what's inside it is just such a delight and i love it next up we have a book that i read more recently and a little bit different in that this is kind of like a literary thrillery kind of book um, and that is white ivy by Susie yang i loved this book like i say i read it um a couple of months ago and just totally fell for it um it's such a multi-layered book and um, claire actually just did a really interesting video that i'll link below where she read this and talked a lot about the ways it's kind of 
almost a modern Gatsby story and about like the American dream. So basically this is about um, our character Ivy who grows up in China and then moves to America when she's very young with her parents and her little brother and her grandmother. They have a kind of very suburban existence um, and Ivy has just always wanted to assimilate. Um, she's kind of a very troubled character from a young age and she has like quite a troubled home life. The tensions are quite high in her family and um, a lot of that is because of you know the status of being an immigrant in America and like I say she's just on this determination to assimilate. She wants to be like a normal American girl she gets fixated on kind of people at school and so we get a lot from her childhood and then the novel skips forward and she is a young woman and again is trying to kind of keep up appearances live this life and she meets up with um, a boy from her childhood who was a very rich like all-American boy she had a crush on and they start this relationship and so she's trying to kind of balance these two parts of her life and it definitely like I say a literary thriller it definitely like gets dark and has some little like it feels very tense all the way through as I say Ivy's a kind of odd kind of dark character um, and that maintains throughout the book there's all this tension around her trying to keep up appearances and and be accepted in this family and there's also quite a few good like twists that do go really dark um, and add to this atmosphere and yeah it feels like a very thrilling story but it's also just like so well written um, so so insightful on so many things like like I say that first part is just a kind of a classic coming of age story it's so interesting about the history of her entire family i was just like hooked throughout this book despite the thriller aspects of it like i would have just been gripped because i think the characters are all done so well they're so three-dimensional the writing's brilliant i love the kind of insight into ivy's mind you see kind of what ivy puts out in the world and what's really going on in her mind um there's just a lot of stuff around the family um i really loved the ending of this book i thought it was going to do something like super predictable and it really didn't and i think that just made it even better in what it was saying about you know what is assimilation or like what will ever make ivy feel secure and stable and feel like she is at home and feel like she is secure and like claire talks about in the video is very much about the american dream um and about kind of constantly trying to hunt down something that at one point in your life you thought would fix all your problems if that makes sense i just really really love this book i haven't seen loads of people talk about it and i couldn't recommend it more it's so good okay next up i have america is not the heart by elaine castillo i really love this book this is a beautiful family kind of intergenerational family drama um we follow three characters in this book three women um in the devera family who are a filipino family who have kind of moved over to the us so you follow hero who is a youngish philippine woman who comes over to america to kind of try and restart her life after some really bad traumatic things have happened in the philippines and she goes to stay with her uncle paul and his wife paz who has also come across to america much earlier and is working as a nurse and paz and paul have a daughter ronnie who is Philippine but has always grown up in America and so we really like focus on these three women and girls to tell the story of this family um to look at immigration very specifically within the Filipino community um and the different ways again it's kind of has definitely has touches of the American dream and of this idea of going to America to start again and to have a better life but the ways in which that is not always easy but even beyond the um aspects of immigration it's just such a well done family story the relationships are not necessarily easy but they're so believable and authentic you have so much sympathy for Paz and Hero despite the fact that these two characters don't really get along and they both have things in their past that they haven't dealt with and then you have Ronnie who is the daughter who I sometimes struggle with like children protagonists protagonists but I loved her she was such a brilliant character and such a kind of great foil to explore all the relationships in that family and this book just like moved me so much um with the relationships it also looks at beyond the deveras um the space that in this part of america filipino immigrants have created for themselves and looking really closely at that community there is a sapphic love story that i thought was done really well and balances out some of the more the heavier stuff that's in this book about um conflict in the philippines and kind of what made this family or at least hero need to come to america it's just 
so like readable like you're really just invested in this family and it's got a good pace but it's beautifully written the food descriptions in here are incredible all the filipino cuisine that's discussed is just amazing it made me so hungry and i love when books write really really well about food so yeah again not another one that i think is not hugely well known although han from let's talk about book maybe she's trying she is trying um but yeah i'd really recommend this one then i have eve out of her ruins by ananda devi so ananda devi is actually a mauritian author but of asian descent and she's actually written a lot of really interesting things about um being an asian author and displacement if you want to read into her like academic work that she's written this is eve out of her ruins so it's set in mauritius and it's a tiny, translated, horrific, like, brutal story about a young girl called Eve who, yeah, is living in a very deprived part of Mauritius. She has a very difficult life. She suffers a lot of abuse at the hands of her parents and um, the kind of world she lives in is incredibly corrupt. It's incredibly misogynistic. And she, as a teenage girl, has come up with a way of dealing with that, that... The rest of society particularly the men don't like she is kind of it's hard to say it's not really like spoilers but she basically um it's a lot about like agency um and kind of not even like reclaiming your sexuality or anything like that in a positive way but but more that the constant brutal misogyny um and like sexual sexual assault that happens in this place um the way eve deals with that and the choices she makes about her body to kind of disconnect from it it's like i say it's super super hard to read um but it's one of the most powerful things i've ever read about violence against women eve is just such a brilliant character because she's so raw and honest and your heart breaks for her she has um like a best friend and their relationship is so beautiful um it's again very like sapphic the love they have for each other compared to what's happening in the outside world and then you also get the perspectives of a lot of the young boys like eve eve's peers living in the same area and the way that they are pulled into toxic masculinity corruption abuse like there's just so much awful like everything in this book is awful and heartbreaking like there isn't much redemption um but that makes it really powerful and the writing kind of goes against that because the writing is so lush and beautiful it's very like raw but the descriptions of mauritius are quite lush but then kind of contrasts with the description of the yeah the city and the pain and the hurt that's happening in here it's just an incredible book i've never read anything like it it's exquisite i'm just reading on the back someone's kind of compared eve to leela from um the new Poulter novels which i can see and yeah it says extraordinary shifting between describing solid often sordid details with vivid precision and soaring into more abstract passages that echo the ebb and flow of the sea like yeah that's exactly how i would describe it if you think you're in a place where you can read like extremely brutal violence against women um or just violence generally then I would really recommend it. It's so stunningly translated. It's just incredible. Then on a slightly more positive note, I have The Housekeeper and the Professor, Professor by Yoko Agawa. This is another translated work, translated from Japanese. And this book is just gorgeous. It's so just beautiful. I love it so much. Um, it's about a professor, uh, like he used to be a maths professor and he now is slightly older and he only has 80 minutes of memory at a time. And therefore he always has to have a housekeeper to kind of keep him like remind him of what's going on he has all these notes written like all over his house to be like this is who you are and so our main character is a housekeeper who gets a job working with the professor and she has a son who she kind of brings along with him sometimes and it's just about the relationship that these three people develop um the kind of found family almost like the love that the professor feels for the young boy the kind of love and friendship that develops between the housekeeper and the professor and it's so like nicely written it's like kind of sparse um but just very easy to read and very almost like whimsical there's a lot about like maths the housekeeper becomes like very interested in these like crazy mathematical things the professor's talking about and he kind of teaches her that while she teaches him about other things in life and it's obviously a lot about memory um and big questions and i think you know using that what would you do if you only had 80 minutes of memory to think about 
I guess, relations to other people and how much does what you remember of someone day to day go into how you feel about them. Um, and yeah, I just love this book so much. It's so heartwarming, a little bit heartbreaking, but it's not depressing. It really is life affirming. I think that word's thrown around a lot, but I really would call this life affirming and it was just a joy and I loved it. I was gonna only include like fiction because I've read some memoirs um, that are like the most incredible memoirs I've ever read in my life, such as Know My Name by Chanel Miller or Inferno by Catherine Cho that I could have talked about. So I was gonna keep it to novels, but then I had to include Persepolis by Marjan Strappi, which is a graphic memoir. So it is a memoir, but because it's a graphic novel, I was like, I'll break the rules for you. Um, I love this book. This is the first and I think only graphic novel that I've ever truly loved. It's not a format that I really get on with, but I read this and just loved it so much. So this is Marjan Strappi's memoir about growing up in Iran during war basically and about her family, um, her parents at the time, what it's like to basically be a young girl who is growing up during conflict in your country but at the same time what it's like just being a young girl growing up anywhere. It manages to talk about completely horrendous acts of destruction, lack of humanity while also Similarly, like with the same weight, chronicling just the normal things that any nine-year-old child would feel and the way they come to understand their parents, their parents' relationship, the way they come to understand themselves. Um, the art style is just like very monochromatic and simple, which I think really works. It gives it so much power when she's talking about, like I say, these atrocities, like war atrocities. Um, this book was so good at kind of educating me a lot more about what was happening in Iran at the time um, and it has a kind of very understated I think because she's remembering these things from when she's a child it's very understated but I thought that only made it more powerful um, and then you know it's about her growing up moving out of Iran leaving her parents um, going to Europe that like broke my heart I was absolutely sobbing my eyes out and then becoming a teenager and then coming back to Iran and it's so interesting as um, a woman living in Iran and having to make decisions about how she wants to live her life in like a Muslim country and, and then kind of her own like politically charged decisions when she's older and kind of that in contrast to when she was a child and it was her parents making those decisions. It's just so beautiful. It's kind of funny. Like it's just so personable because, you know, it is her memoir and you really feel like she's just telling you about her life, but she has in many ways had quite an extraordinary life. So it is really powerful. It is just beautiful. There's so much love in here. It's just so intelligent. I adored it. Okay, penultimately we have Everything I Never Told You by Celeste Ng. Oh, I love Celeste Ng so much, um, but this one of hers has to be my favorite because it's just the most heartbreaking family drama I've potentially ever read. Like it's one of the saddest books that I've ever read, but at the same time, such a beautiful book. So this is about a Chinese American family um, in the 1970s and the they have three kids and the oldest daughter goes missing and right at the start of the novel is discovered dead um, in a lake. And so we follow the family as they move through their grief, but also kind of trying to work out what happened to Lydia. And so it's not like a mystery, it's not like a thriller, it's really about a family moving through grief which is obviously really sad but that's not even the worst part you get so much about like how this family came to be so the father James was Chinese and Marilyn is white and you find so much out about their relationship and what it's like being a mixed race family in the 1970s in America and each member of this family you know Lydia's two younger siblings who've always felt in the shadows because Lydia's always been kind of the favorite you just find out so much about all of the pain and suffering that each of these family members are hiding and the ways in which over the time and the years before Lydia died they've all kind of done so much damage to each other but unintentionally to a point and I think that's what makes this book so brilliant I think it's easy uh to write a book where all the characters are awful to each other and it's really sad um but to be able to do exactly that but also make you feel for them and make you understand and make you just feel so heartbroken for, for how wrong it went for these people who ultimately did just love each other but loved each other in completely the wrong way and made so many mistakes. I love the 1970s setting. It has that kind of like nostalgic feeling of, you know, when we get Lydia's point of view, being a teenager in the 1970s, sibling relationships, feeling like you are the kind of forgotten child and your sister's a golden child. It's just the character work in here is 
incredible, like so incredible. They all felt like such fully formed people and it just fully broke my heart into pieces because like I say, you love them and ultimately you and they see all the mistakes they've ever made and that led to a point where their daughter ended up dead and that makes sound really depressing. I mean, it is, but also it's great. And then finally, you didn't think I'd get through a video without talking about Hani and Gahara, did you? No, I couldn't do it. What can I say? If you've been here before, you know me. I'm a Hania Fanagahara. I love her. I've read both her novels, The People in the Trees and A Little Life. I could have chosen either of them because they were both five star books for me. This is the best book I read last year. A Little Life is probably the best book I've read so far this year. It's got a little bit of competition. So she's obviously on this list. Um, I chose The People in the Trees just because it's still a bit more of like the underdog. You know, everyone knows about A Little Life. But I don't hear this getting the attention it needs. This is about, I literally put this one in last so that anyone who regularly watches my videos can just be like, okay, peace out. So thanks for coming, bye, love you, who's staying. This is about a doctor who in the 1950s goes on like a research trip to a Micronesian island that is uninhabited officially, but there's rumors about this tribe, this like lost tribe of people who've been living there. So he goes on an anthropological mission there and he's kind of like the doctor and when they're there they do find this tribe of lost people and basically they all are much older than they should be and they think potentially they found you know a way to live forever um but the novel is narrated in hindsight so we are reading the Dr Norton Perina's memoirs but we know that these memoirs have been written from prison because much later when he came back to America he's been arrested for abusing one of his adopted children because he adopted a lot of children um and so we're reading his memoirs about he takes us right back to the start of his life takes us all through childhood teenagehood takes us to the island and takes us to the present but the memoirs that we're reading have also gone through his editor so there's a lot of um like footnotes and kind of framing of it by his is his editor it's kind of like his colleague's assistant who is obsessed with him so if you like unreliable narration, like this is it because there's just so many layers of perspective that are that you're going through before you get the real story. Um, and obviously, you know from the start of the novel, this guy's been arrested, so you've got your own kind of perceptions about him as you're reading his life story. But it lulls you in to such a I don't know, I want to say like false sense of security, but this book is lush and vivid and rich in its descriptions of the island and you get so sucked into what happens on the island. Like I say, I love almost like a survival story. We're spending a lot of time in this place. It's kind of mystical and confusing, but also quite dark. And there's just so much darkness throughout the book. It does get extremely brutal towards the end, I will say. Um, but in a way that I think, I know a lot of people find it unnecessary and that's fair enough for me, it worked because it's so powerful and really this book's about morality um and how different morality can be depending on where you're looking at it it's about corruption it's about power um i honestly love it it's such an amazing book and you should read it if you haven't already well they are the 10 books that i wanted to recommend to you hope that you enjoyed it please do let me know if you've read any of these books or what some of your favorite books are by asian or pacific islander authors i would love to know thanks so much for watching obviously i would love if you subscribed my instagram my storygraph will be linked down below and i'll see you in the next one bye